We're going to move around our discussion, bring our panelists for R&D up to the stage, and keep our recognition session for the very end. I would like to get started with the very last panel, the new way of R&D and how we're innovating faster and smarter. There's no doubt that technology is probably a part of it. I'm going to invite up to the stage the panelists. Can I please have Tamar L.D. Farag, the Medical Affairs Manager and Associate Director of Str Strategy and Operations at Merrick to come on up so we can start this conversation. I also have Dr. Pranang Garg, Dr. Tobias Winkler, and Jaron Kato who's coming up to join this conversation. I'm looking forward to understanding where is research and development today and where it's going. There's no doubt it's going to be driven by some of this technology, right? So like I say, I always like to connect people. I am the connection catalyst. If you see a discussion that piques your interest, but you don't have the time to connect, take a picture, post it on LinkedIn, tag these industry leaders, and start the conversation there. We don't want to miss that opportunity. Thank you, panelists. It's over to you. Enjoy a great conversation. Time's on the clock. And if you'd like to leave open some time to engage, just leave a little early, OK? okay. See you soon. Thank you for the introduction. Um, let me ask the audience, who has a background in, R in drug discovery, R&D? Raise a hand. OK. I see a lot of online hands. <laughs> uh, actually. So um, this topic is about how we increase the R&D efficiency. And then who knows about the Gordon Moore's, um, Moore's law from uh, one of the co-founder of Intel? Yes. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. And then um, what we describe our pharma industry is E-Room's no law. Who knows about E-Room's law? So, so the Moore's law is all about like how exponentially increase the speed of uh, what was that? The, the, on the, the CPU power. CPU power, but on the other Correct hand. Correct me if I'm wrong. Yes, on the other hand, uh, sadly in pharma R and D, our efficiency is going one way down. And then let's hear about how it is like in reality from Thomas' um, experience. Thank you, thank you, Joran. It's very interesting, the topic that we're talking about. Um, I wanna start with some facts, just to show you the, the extent of the, of the issue. Um, do you know the spending, or the average spending on a new drug discovery or a new drug um, uh, discovery to come to the market? Um, in 90s, the cost for having a drug coming to the market was around 200 million US dollars. Nowadays, this figure has doubled to around 400 million US dollars just to have one molecule, one drug to come to the market. Moreover, only in the US, in the past year only, the amount of spending on drug discovery or drug development for a molecule that not even reaching the final stage to be in the market is almost between 1 billion to 2 billion. And there are several reasons for the increase in the spending in, uh, in, in, uh, in R&D, also a lot of reasons for the low entry for these molecules. One of the most common reasons is increased complexity of drug uh, development nowadays as we move forward for targeted therapy and looking at uh, more of um, personalized medicine compared to the uh, previous good days when uh, new drug discovery was much easier looking at the chemical molecules and other molecules. So this is one of the reasons. The other reasons is actually increasing the complexity and the cost for running a clinical trial. And all of these have been impacting the pharmaceutical industry in many ways that the industry has looked at maybe reducing the R&D budget and looking at acquiring or ac acquisition for a smaller companies with current or existing product portfolio or running pipelines. This is from one side. The other side that it ended up with what we call in the pharmaceutical business
is a drive pipeline for many organizations or pharmaceutical industry. And the main reason is that a lot of molecules that is in the preclinical and clinical phases, they reach a moment of um, not passing and failure of going into the clinical studies, for example, or the, the clinical research. And that's why you find the organizations entering into uh, what's so called drive pipeline. And when you, when you don't have enough molecules in your pipeline of R&D, then you're expecting uh, a big or dramatic also reduce in the revenue for these organizations. So all these challenges to <coughs> sorry, together, uh, Joran, reduce the spending and the innovation in R&D. Pharmaceutical industry are looking at solutions, how they can look into this in a different way, especially from the preclinical and clinical research. Just wanted to shed the light on the challenges, and I think I would leave it if we look into the how we look at the preclinical um, um, research and preclinical studies um, in the current days. I will leave it for you and Tobias also to look at it. Yes. So just for those people who are not familiar with uh, research in drug discovery, it takes like over 10 years to brush up the compounds. You have to identify the opportunity and then s um, generate lots of candidates, screen for active compounds, screen for efficacious and then um, safe compounds, and then test in animal and then to be tested in human. Uh, because of uh, frequent change and then like uh, because of the pain in industry to change the strategy, there's so many shelved assets. So what the industry creatively um, came up with is the new um, R&D model where um, high risk, low stage um, discovery is taken care of by academic institutions or uh, venture startup like us and then a um, major pharmaceutical company will focus on later stage development where it requires major funding. So um, in my case, what happened is I was in a research organization in Takeda. Um, then there's a major organizational restructuring. So there are lots of different opportunities are given to the employee. So I took an option, took advantage of the initiative and then with help from Takeda as well as uh, uh, venture capitalist, we raised a fund and then started a new company. And then this company is called Jexwell and then tried to uh, creatively and uh, quickly progress and then identify alternative op opportunity of uh, shelved assets using the AI and uh, data mining and then quickly progress to phase one study. Now it's test being tested in Australia soon to be uh, finished and then tested in, um, hope, hopefully in patients. So that, that's early stage drug discovery. But, but let's hear more about like what is like in um, late stage development. Tobias. Yeah, late stage development. Um, this is the jump already to market approval, uh, I would say. So if you, if you um, develop a drug, uh, as you said, you have the preclinical models, you have the preclinical proof of concept, you go to a safety study, a phase one study, and then you go uh, make a dose finding study, uh, go to a phase two early efficacy, and then you go to a phase three, which would be then uh, already market approval, uh, uh, a pivotal uh, market approval study, uh, which is then the decisive uh, one uh, for market entry, of course. Um, and the costs are getting higher and higher, and the dropouts are getting more and more. So I think, uh, only one out of, um, don't name it on this number, but one out of uh, uh, 20 uh, studies, uh, early stage studies will be uh, then successful in the end and sometimes even less. So um, this is why it's so important to really evaluate your phase one, two studies very good uh, and very well uh, if you then go to the, uh, to the uh, approval study. Um, I'm from an academic center, so um, we are mainly carrying uh, drugs or I mean in my, uh, in my um, uh, role as a regenerative uh, therapist, ATMPs mostly, so advanced therapy uh, medicinal products, um, up to maybe 2A uh, uh, ourselves. So this is the utmost that academia can actually uh, handle without a, a very powerful partner, uh, uh, strategic partner. 
and this academic uh, corporate partnerships, they do sometimes already start in a, in a phase one, uh, um, because you have to plan together, of course. Um, but this is actually the way that, that uh, from academia, spin-outs uh, to phase three are then uh, created uh, to look for a strategic partner. So open innovation, it's all about open innovation and collaboration, collaborative efforts. I'm just curious how you handle the IP generated out of such activities. We generally, um, uh, so the, the university that I work in, it has 20,000 people uh, working in, um, they have a clear IP strategy. So everything that I invent myself or my group invents, for example, does belong to the uni university. Um, and this is a service in invention, it's called. And uh, so you have to offer them this, and if they decline that, you can do whatever you like with it, otherwise they uh, promote this. And in later stages, of course, then also accompany you uh, in approaching corporate partners and strategic partners. So there is a, 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 an advantage and a disadvantage in that. But this IP is then normally, um, normally either given as a license also from academia or, as a, uh, or they sell it, no? or they sell the patent. But it's always a joint, uh, uh, a joint IP strategy because otherwise it would not be interesting for academia at all to, to start these things. Great, so, so is there like any supportive structure for clinician or researcher to, uh, you know, to work through the IPs? Or yeah. legal so matters. if this question is, is related to me, uh, then uh, it's um, we have in at the charity a lot of supportive structures for that. So we have a, a clinical uh, affairs unit, uh, we, we have a, a business uh, unit that calculates the case. We have patient organizations that look at the at the product before, uh, and we are accompanying. And we also have a tech transfer that is very huge, and that is accompanying us. So we have a lot of supportive structures because me as a researcher and as a clinician, I cannot. I have, I do not have the know-how. I build up this know-how, but I can't do it myself because it's also so much work. Also with the regulatories, as you, yeah. as you also uh, are in deeply involved, I would say. Correct. Yeah, there, there's a lot of models that have been introduced and in collaboration between academia, sometimes also crowdsourcing like innovation hubs. And it's actually funded and generated by pharmaceutical industries, like the pharmaceutical industry that I'm working with is uh, with, with, which is Merck. Um, we create some sort of innovation hubs where uh, the organization is sharing their interest in the areas, the specific areas of research and development. And it's an open source where researchers, academia, they can pitch their ideas or molecules and it's gonna be um, in the preclinical uh, phase, and of course the IP could be a shared IP, or it could be in the licensing phase that it's sold um, uh, later on to the uh, pharmaceutical industry. So I see a lot of um, innovation hubs that is happening from different multinational pharmaceutical companies, um, and it's actually across uh, uh, the continent. So it's not one place that serves all, because we know also that um, developing a drug requires also looking at the, the epidemiology of a certain disease and also the patient characteristics and demographics. So this is one way of looking at things. But also pharmaceutical industries started to realize that is is not the way forward to work in silos. That's why they started to do what's so-called pharmaceutical co-creation, where actually the drug development in the clinical phase is done in collaboration or joint venture between two major pharmaceutical company, this definitely reduce the risks and reduce the cost and increase the exposure for the clinical trial, increase or speed up the process for the, um, for the phase three clinical trials and getting the medication or getting the approvals, the regulatory approvals much faster and easier. So these are ways that we're looking at to innovate the R&D and looking at how the pharmaceutical industry in collaboration with um, uh, startups in research or joint ventures or um, uh, um, uh, research academia can collaborate together to foster and maybe increase the speed or the, the pace of the clinical development for new molecules. Um, for the corporations, we also, um, as I told you before, uh, um, we have in, at the charity, uh, 
also are in the process of creating an incubator hub together with pharma. So the, the Charité and BIH, that's the Berlin Institute of Health, co-creates a space together with Bayer uh, as an angel investor, but also getting other uh, pharma companies and other companies in for cell and gene therapy. So this is the, and in this hub, academic, uh, academians, academic group, uh, startup groups are working uh, together, supported, and uh, if this product is then successful, they are passed on and go on and they have immediate support from pharma. So this can be these incubators uh, that, that we know from Boston also, uh, surely also from the Asian uh, uh, area. Uh, these are be, be very important uh, in these high risk, high gain areas like cell and gene therapy, for example. So any final thoughts how we can improve this collaborative efforts from perhaps from a large organization perspective and uh, perhaps from academic perspective? Um, it's actually, it's a, it's a joint collaboration because the challenges is not only on the uh, development side, that it's a big part between the pharma industry or big pharma um, startups and academia, but also the collaboration with the authorities and regulators in order to um, uh, facilitate the drug discovery and the, uh, the drug licensing, especially in rare disease and um, uh, novel molecules. And we see now that there is a, a move forward with, um, um, with specifically with the new drug discovery, novel molecules that is actually treating rare diseases or new diseases that there is no current modalities to treat. And we see um, fast track for approval. Um, uh, in FDA, for example, at the moment that is was not was not there ten years ago. This is something also to facilitate and encourage the academia pharma to work onto these rare diseases that requires a lot of investment in the in the R and D. Um, the other element also is um, facilitating the um, the early drug entry for for certain countries, which is called main patient cases as well, where. Um, definitely there is a process for this, but it's a way also to bring the medication or to bring the treatment, especially for same uh, uh, patient uh, groups that they don't have current treatment in, in, in place in the market. So the early entry for, for these medication, and we saw that by the way with the COVID vaccine, that it had the fast track for the approval in the FDA, followed by early entry uh, uh, for, for, for patients or for um, um, further test subjects. So this is a way, I think, a collaboration between academia, startups, pharmaceutical industry, and also regulators to find a way of simplicity of the process, keeping the efficiency and the patient safety at the center. So next to the, uh, uh, to the creation of a new pandemic <laughs> as an accelerator, I would also maybe just as a twitch and another view, uh, 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 bring one thing in that is very important or will be very important in the future, which is modeling. So uh, through modeling, FE, uh, finite element analysis uh, and modeling, mathematical modeling, we can decrease uh, study sizes. Uh, so there is uh, this approach, it's called in silico trials. Uh, there is a company, even in silico trials, like an Italian company. Um, and there are also uh, uh, working groups in the FDA that uh, really look at these in silico models um, that with, not with, AI, but also with AI, but, but with mathematical models, uh, calculate p outcomes and thereby reduce patient numbers and thereby also enable uh, larger phase three trials, for example, to be reduced in costs. And this will be very interesting in the future also. That's interesting. Now you mentioned that I think one of the successful case would be the um, virtual drug-drug interaction um, test by in silico, so I hope like those tools or new invention will accelerate the future drug discovery process. So I think that that's, uh, that's all from our story. Um, any question or not thoughts from audience? On my mic, oh, there we go. I know it's hard to get everybody to jump off at the same time, right? There's no doubt that by the end of day three, everyone oh, needs a little pick-me-up. So I suggest, since I'm out here in the audience, I'm going to go around and start engaging. What do you guys think? Okay, so you talked about R&D. Oh, you're coming? I like it. When I come into the audience, people start getting up. 
You know, how are you? Great, thanks for getting up. We got a question, go for it. Uh, so, um, thanks for the panels. Um, since um, uh, we are in a medical device company, so uh, the team includes, you know, diagnosis and the medical device. Um, in your opinion, uh, 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 I want to hear your opinion that um, what needs to be uh, keep in mind to uh, develop the uh, into a medical device uh, rather than uh, developing, uh, you know, a diagnosis. Rather than, sorry, a medical device uh, rather than? I mean, uh, uh, developing the drugs. Yeah, so uh, there are, for medical devices, there are several different, uh, I think there is very, it's very important where you are. So in Europe, we have the medical device regulation that has completely uh, <laughs> revolutionized the market in several aspects that, that you might know. So uh, the um, companies have now uh, the, ob uh, the obligation to report on clinical outcomes for each medical device, which means implants also, if you, have a, if you only use 100 implants, you have to report fully clinical evaluation reports to the authorities, uh, which means that a lot of medical devices have been wiped from the market uh, and only larger companies can actually uh, uh, do this. And also the FDA has, uh, the FDA is actually still softer than the Europeans at the moment for medical devices. Um, however, if you look at the, um, the EMG, EMG uh, so the, 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 uh, the drug uh, uh, laws, it's still easier to get a medical device approved and to uh, hold it on the market than, than a drug uh, because all the pharmacovigilance and, and the, uh, uh, the safety data has still, is still more pressure, has still more pressure on the pharma uh, side. Okay, well, let's see. He's got his question answered. Is there anybody else that would like to ask our panelists some questions about R&D, if it's relative to them? We've got people looking at the phones, looking at the computers. Let's give them a round of applause. Guys, you've done a great job on the panel as the last panel for the day. Thank you, thank you, thank you for sharing all your expertise. Come to the front of the stage, please, as everyone takes a picture. It's great to have all these experts it is not an easy feat. We got people from all over the world. Flew in this morning from Germany, right? Where did you fly in from? From Dubai, very far, very far he traveled. <laughs> you flew in for town too, right? Japan, oh my God. You know, all these people come in here to come together. Are you guys having a good show? Good, amazing so far? Okay, great. You see how everyone already made their connections or outsized talking. You know, they miss this R&D, but you can watch this live on YouTube, share it again and again, and I'm sure people will be contacting you from this valuable insight. So thank you. Thank you so much for joining us. Yes. Well done. Well done.